Rather than pitch a fresh pouch of yeast into every batch of beer, most professional breweries reuse yeast harvested from previous batches, and that practice is commonly replicated at the homebrew level. But how best to do it? And what are the limitations? Well, Brulosophy contributor Jordan Foulkes has harvested yeast for reuse over 100 times, and he's going to show us exactly how he does it. Plus, we're going to take a look at the results of an experiment to see if blind tasters could tell the difference between a beer brewed with harvested yeast versus one brewed with a packet of fresh yeast. Let the yeast harvesting begin. This episode is sponsored by Great Fermentations. More on them in a bit. Hey, I'm Jordan Fawkes, and I'm one of the contributors to Blasphy. Jordan, I've reused yeast from other batches in a number of different ways. I have overbuilt starters and just kept those in my fridge. I've frozen yeast and then brought it back to life. And then I've even just taken a, a keg where I fermented in the keg. And uh, when it got done, I just kind of poured more beer on top of the keg. But we want to talk about a process that you're doing with yeast harvesting. Right. So uh, I brew a lot of beer and it's really economical and really easy to reuse yeast. You know, it's a lot easier to just grab it from the refrigerator instead of going to the homebrew store. And uh, I'm making great beer with it. And, you know, the pros even say that the best beer is a few generations down the line. So maybe there's some sort of, you know, organoleptic advantage to it as well. The first question I always have is like, how many times can I get away with no. any of this kind of thing? If I go more than a, one or two generations, I'm probably going to end up with like some kind of Franken yeast that I don't, I don't know what to do with. Uh, but I believe that in commercial brewing, they will actually go through quite a few different generations of yeast. Yeah, you know, I'm friends with a lot of local brewers here in Portland, and going up to ten generations is not uncommon. And then those breweries will then pawn it off to their friends at other breweries will go another 10 generations beyond that. At the homebrew level, uh, I think that I tend to stop around five. I've had a couple times when the yeast generation went bad and uh, you don't know until a few weeks later until the beer is you know, kegged and ready to drink. So as long as you're minding your sanitization P's and Q's, you're really probably going to be okay for a few generations. So tell me, how do you do it? So first off, I ferment in kegs, but that is not necessarily relevant really any fermentation vessel is fine. So once you get your beer out of your fermentation vessel, there's a big yeast cake left at the bottom. And so you got to get it out of your fermentation vessel. For me in a keg, uh, I swirl it around and I uh, pour it out, uh, you know, a fancy conical, you could probably blast it out with some CO2 pressure out of the bottom dump port, but you just got to get it out of there. So you get your yeast out of your fermentation vessel into a clean and sanitized jar. How much of what you've taken out is just the yeast cake at the bottom. I mean, do you have little bits of the beer left over from whatever was in there beforehand? That's a good point. You're going to have to have a leave a little bit of the beer behind in order to actually get it out of there. Now, you could use some pre-boiled water or something like that, uh, but I just use beer. I figure that's the most sanitiz sanitized you know, medium I could possibly use. The beer just fermented with the very yeast I'm hoping to collect, right? And so I would think that the beer on top of it is good enough to be the, the medium to actually get it out. So you need to leave a little bit behind just so you have some viscosity to actually get it out of the vessel. Okay, so we've got the yeast slurry out of the vessel. What on earth do we do with it now? You want to probably label it because if you're like me, you got a lot of cultures in your little refrigerator there. And so uh, I like to put the generation, the you know yeast brand and variety and name and stuff like that, and the date in which I jarred it. And then you just seal the lid and you put it in there. Now you could use uh, a flask or some other sort of vessel, um, but you know, just some sort of small thing that holds it. Um, I wouldn't put it in a measuring cup that you just leave out to the open air. Um, and they say that there are some concerns around uh, pressure. I haven't found that to be the case. So I'm comfortable just using a standard kind of mason jar and sealing it tight and then putting it in the fridge until I'm ready to use it uh, later. When I use a packet of commercial yeast, it says on the packet how many billion cells approximately I'm going to have in that packet. So Imperial yeast is going to say there's 200 billion cells in that packet. If I'm picking up one of these yeast slurries, how do I even approximate how many cells are in there? Right. So therein lies the rub. But it's actually really easy. So I got this method from an old Y yeast article, which probably still exists in the depths of the internet. And they provided some simple rules of thumb for estimating the cell count based on the slurry uh, concentration. 
And so what I did is I just kind of took the fundamentals of that math and rounded it um, to even numbers to make it super easy. So what you're going to do is uh, you're going to put that your yeast in the refrigerator and let it settle. Because when you collect it, it's going to all be homogenized and just be an entire, you know, yeasty mess. After a day or two, the yeast is going to fall out of suspension and collect at the bottom of your jar or your settling vessel. And above it will be your beer or your water or whatever you use to uh, mix the yeast into your uh, collection vessel. And so what's really helpful is a lot of mason jars actually have milliliter marks on the sides of them. Those are the ones I use. If you don't have that, you could measure it uh, and then like use a marker or something to mark it. But you want to know approximately how many milliliters of pure slurry is collected at the bottom of your jar. The math here is really simple. All you're going to do is you're going to take the milliliters of pure slurry at the bottom of the jar and you're going to multiply that by two. That's how many billion cells you have approximately at the starting point of the yeast highest level of viability. So if we have 100 milliliters of pure yeast, yeast slurry at the bottom of the jar, that is approximately 200 billion cells of fresh yeast. So at that point, when it's time to use that slurry in an upcoming beer, then I suppose if you already know what the starting point was, you can use a typical yeast calculator to figure out what the viability is at the time you're pitching it when you're ready for your next brew. Exactly, because I'm typically not brewing the same day I'm collecting the yeast. And so maybe the next week when I'm ready to brew again, uh, it's settled out, I can just take the, the estimated cell count pop that into the calculator and then discount the viability. And so if I started with, let's say 200 billion cells, and then a week later, it says it's down to 180, then I can use that uh, as a starting point. So I'll frequently collect a ton of yeast because these fermentations produce maybe four times the amount that you started with. So it might take even a couple of jars if you want to collect the entire uh, fermentation vessels amount. And so I typically don't have to even use the entire jar. Do you take this straight out of the fridge and then pitch it directly? Do you let it warm up to room temperature first? Do you give it any kind of preparation, do a vitality start or anything like that? If the yeast was super old and it was like a gallon of slurry was 100 billion cells, maybe I do a start of the day before or uh, a vitality starter. But generally speaking, no, I'm just pitching straight as long as the number's at it. So how many times would you say you've done this and has it always been successful? I don't know how many, I don't think I could count, over 100 easily. And uh, I've only been burned twice. And it was the same yeast pitch, unfortunately. Maybe fortunately, because it's really only happened to me once. But out of 100 plus times, only had a problem with one of the cultures. So that's Jordan's process. And to me, this sounds both fairly simple to put off and has delivered reliably good results. But I have heard of situations where harvesting yeast would be, let's say, less than ideal. Let me ask you, Jordan, a couple of limitations and you tell me if you think this would be a problem or not. And let's start with what if I am taking yeast from a dark beer and then using it in a, let's say, a light lager. This is a common concern. And in my experience, it's not been a problem. In fact, I currently have a Czech pale lager on draft right now that was repitched from a Czech dark lager. Now, the Czech dark lager yeast, or if you did a stout or something like that, the yeast slurry at the bottom is noticeably darker. My guess is there's a lot of, you know, dark beer caught up in the, the yeast itself. Um, as opposed to a paler beer, it tends to be more whiter and whiter. And so the pale Czech lager that's on draft right now, perfectly yellow, perfectly clear. In no way did it come out amber because of this little bit of yeast pitch that went into the beer. All right. What about if I have dry hopped? in my original beer. Right, so this is when you might wanna consider rinsing or washing your yeast. Uh, as I recall, rinsing is simply using like clean boiled water or something like that to separate the pure yeast slurry from any sort of non-yeast particulate that might be in solution. Uh, washing is a more of a chemical process that homebrewers don't really do involving acids or something like that. I, at that point, me personally, I would just toss it because the whole assumption there is that you have a pure slurry to begin with. Now, the last limitation I've heard is that you shouldn't use a yeast that was from a high gravity beer in a low gravity beer because it's more likely to be stressed and kind of worn out and won't be able to do an awful lot. 
my guideline, as long as I'm, you know, below 1070, I'm comfortable repitching that. But if I was to brew a super high gravity, you know, bourbon barrel aged destined imperial stout, I think that's one and done. The other concern that you've heard that we often hear is kettle soured beers, that the fermentation, the acidic fermentation is too rough on the yeast and you wouldn't want to repitch that. I actually tested that before I was a member of Brewlosophy and uh, I made a Kolsch following a Berliner Weisse that turned out great. So I think that there is some risk involved with any of these methods related to kind of harsher fermentation environments in the um, prior generation. But, you know, your mileage may vary. You might get away with it. Now, we did perform an experiment on the impact of harvesting yeast. But before we get to that, a quick word on today's sponsor, Great Fermentations. Family owned and operated for more than 25 years, Great Fermentations offers a huge range of brewing supplies and equipment. Great Fermentations are well known for their top-notch customer service, which I can personally attest to. I brought my very first brewing system from these guys, and even though I was a complete novice, their helpful expertise got me up and running in no time. Great Fermentations offer the ability to custom build your malt bills in fractional amounts, so you're not forced to order a full pound increment when let's say you only need a half or a quarter pound or something. And shipping is free on most orders over $59. Check them out at greatfermentations.com. One of the things you mentioned, Jordan, was that you were a little bit uncomfortable with high gravity beers and then using those and repitching. So we found the highest gravity experiment I could find on brewlosophy.com to see how that worked out. Uh, this one's from Marshall Shot, and Marshall brewed a barley wine. It had an OG of 1099. So well beyond your threshold, you probably would not be reusing and harvesting this yeast, right? Yeah, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. You know, it's just too much of a risk. Indeed, but all in the name of science. So Marshall was brewing a blonde ale, so he collected 400 milliliters of the yeast slurry. I'm curious, in the article, does he mention the viability loss or the jarring date and when he's brewing? So yes, he did, he does, and it was the next day. Right. And so at that point, you pretty much have no viability loss. So uh, as long as the OG of the subsequent beer, that was a good pitch rate, it sounds like at least you have enough cells. Uh, Marshall also notes that he did allow time for compacting as well. So as you mentioned before, you start off with actually a higher volume and then it compacts down. And in this case, it did compact down to what he was looking for, which is 400 milliliters. Right. So, I mean, at the very least, as far as we can tell, it sounds like he's pitching the right amount. But I think the real question is, are there any sort of off flavors or fermentation flaws that might occur? Indeed. Okay. So Marsha goes through his brew day. So he's brewing a big batch of blonde ale, then creates basically two vitality starters into a couple of one liter growlers. So in one, he pitches the wort and the slurry. And in the other, he pitches the wort and a fresh packet of flagship yeast. So he was going through the vitality process, which you said you don't typically bother with uh, if you are pitching the right amount of yeast in this case. Yeah. And, you know, I used to do it as a rule of thumb if it was too old, but I s just started trying it without that step. And it, I was still making great beers with no fermentation problems that I could notice. Uh, but, you know, given how high of an OG this was, I think this is a reasonable piece of insurance. Four hours later, those vitality starters were pitched into two separate fermenters. Eight hours post pitch, he took a peek into the fermenters and there's clearly more activity going on with the yeast slurry than there was with the fresh yeast. Yeah, and this doesn't really surprise me that much, even though I guess it could have gone either way. I would think that either that would be the case because uh, the fresh yeast might have some sort of lag phase associated with being stored in package. Meanwhile, the repitch had just been fermenting a beer, you know, a couple days prior. Uh, or maybe I would expect nothing would happen because the yeast would just be dead from such a high OG fermentation. So uh, at the very least, it seems like the yeast is alive. It does. And that is borne out in the final gravity readings, which is to say that they both had the same final gravity of 1.007. Right. And so clearly, at the very least, it successfully fermented the beer. But what I want to know, does it actually taste the same or better or worse? So a total of 21 people took this experiment. Each participant was served one sample of the beer fermented with fresh yeast and two samples of the beer fermented with the slurry then asked to identify the unique sample. 
At this sample size, 12 tasters would have to identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance, which is exactly how many were able to do so, indicating participants could reliably distinguish a blonde ale fermented with a fresh pitch versus one made with a slurry from barley wine. Does he mention anything about taster preference? Was it split? Was one better than the other? The 12 participants who made the accurate selection were then asked to specify a preference. A total of seven tasters reported preferring the beer fermented with the fresh yeast, four said they liked the beer fermented with the high OG slurry, and one taster reported perceiving no difference. Right, so almost a two to one ratio. What did Marshall say? What was his perspective? Of the eight semi-blind triangle tests that Marshall took, he accurately identified the unique sample six times, and he was able to detect it primarily by aroma. So he says, whereas the beer fermented with the fresh yeast smelled like a pretty standard pub-style blonde ale, the one pitched with the slurry had a sort of rubbery thing going on. It wasn't overwhelming, but it was something that was very noticeable. So I think at this point, we have a piece of evidence that suggests that there could be some concerns with fermenting a new beer that previously that used yeast that previously fermented a high OG one. We're getting an off aroma. And this really doesn't surprise me. This is consistent with what we hear in the literature, or at least with the old wives tales that, you know, this stuff, it, it's just had such a long and arduous journey. It's maybe time to, you know, hang up and we give that one, a, you know, a rest. Vindicated, Jordan. You're absolutely vindicated with your uh, your cutoff period there for the high gravity beers. But even then, I'm going up to 1065 or so and repitching, and uh, you'll hear people say don't repitch above 1050. So uh, I think there's some wiggle room there, but at a certain point, there might be a point of no return. Now, just last question for you, Jordan. If I was to to, to take a peek in your fridge, how many jars of slurry would I find in there? Well, I also have a lot of sour cultures in there as well. So I probably got 10 or so at any given time. But uh, these days, I've kind of just been really enjoying fermenting everything with lager yeast. So I'll ferment uh, my ales and my lagers with clean strain like Global or Pilgrimage. And uh, it's really reduced the number of jars I have at any given time in my fridge. Well, thank you, Jordan. Outside of those high OG beers, I do think this is something I'd like to try a bit more often. Now, is yeast harvesting part of your own brewing process? And do you do anything different to Jordan's process? If so, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear about it. Now, an alternative to storing harvested yeast in the fridge is to freeze it. And there it can remain viable for years. So to learn how to do that, watch this video here.